Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Angela Rotenberg. I am the VP of Marketing for Redwood Plastics and Rubber. And today's webinar will be on plastics and rubber myths, misconceptions and FAQs. So we'll get started in just a couple minutes. We'll leave um, a couple minutes for people to kind of straggle in and we'll get started um, just after the hour. Thanks so much. Hi again, everybody. Um, again, my name is Angela Rodenberg. I am the VP of Marketing here at Redwood Plastics and Rubber. And thanks everybody for joining us for today's webinar on plastics and rubber myths, misconceptions, and FAQs. Today's presenter is Matt Long. He is our development manager here at Redwood Plastics and just one of the many um, experts in performance plastics and rubber here at our company and he's been with us for eight years and is very knowledgeable in regards to a bunch of different materials and applications. So I will hand it over to Matt. Please leave um, some questions at the end. There is a little um, Q&A bar off on your right there if you want to write any questions and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will hand it over to Matt. All right, thank you so much, Angela, uh, for that introduction. Uh, as Angela said, uh, I've been here for eight years. Uh, Angela has been my manager the whole time, so I have to, you know, if I have a, a good plastic knowledge and a, a good opportunity here to share, I have to throw some credit in her direction for giving me the opportunity. So just a quick introduction to what we'll be discussing today. Uh, it's a little bit different than our first uh, webinar for customers that we did, uh, I guess it's a couple months ago on bearings by Kevin Smith. Uh, this is not so much uh, specifically related to any sort of application or issue. When I was considering what webinar I felt would be best, um, it was just that certain issues had been coming up over my entire eight-year career here, and there were some misconceptions and some myths and also some FAQs that I kept on getting uh, over and over. And I felt that it would be in our customers' best interest to work through those, to identify those. And I believe it will actually help you a lot in the long run. So let's, let's dive into it here, starting with a little bit more of an introduction on myself. So yeah, that's a recent picture of me from just a couple days ago. So I started here in 2012, as Angela said, eight years ago in a business development role. Uh, my task was primarily to drive new business via cold calling, old fashioned over the telephone, uh, to generate accounts primarily in territories where we didn't have outside sales on the ground. Uh, in addition, and this is uh, important, uh, I handled all of our website uh, requests that came in. And within a few years, I was also running our website live chat. So if you happen to have a live chat on our website, uh, well, anytime since we've had it, uh, chances are the majority of the time you got myself, especially if some guy just named Matt popped up on the live chat, that was me. So uh, I had a role change, as Angela said, I, I had a role change to become development manager in 2018, and my responsibilities changed there um, to now include in addition to sales, I always, had, I always was involved in marketing, particularly if you've read the blog or uh, website articles on our website, redwoodplastics.com. Uh, those are primarily myself, and they've been so since I've started here. Uh, but with my new role, I moved into corporate training as well. So I don't train everybody in the company, such as you know, shippers or, or manufacturing staff. Uh, what I do is I train our sales staff. So 
Some of that is ongoing training, such as I run uh, online quizzes every three months. I, I write a monthly article uh, on training to assist them, as well as all new sales staff spend uh, three days with me in a classroom setting doing formal product application and sales training. Uh, lastly, I was a member of the IEPD, the International Association of Plastics Distribution uh, University Honor Society inaugural class. That's a bit of a mouthful there, but uh, that was a great honor. Uh, I actually was the first person ever to complete all the courses that were offered by the IEPD. Uh, some of the courses were quite long. One of them took me a year and uh, they were very in-depth, but I've always been someone who felt like the best way I can help my customers, the best way I can help our staff and my coworkers is to have as much knowledge as possible. And you've heard that old cliche, knowledge is power, and so I wanted to learn as much as I could. So why are we doing this presentation? Well, I mentioned at the title screen that a number of myths and misconceptions are out there regarding plastics and rubber. And this is understandable because unless you're in an industry where these plastics are critical or you're in the plastics industry itself, uh, people don't really understand what are performance or industrial plastics. And just a note here, in my presentation, I'm gonna use performance and industrial interchangeably. So when I say one or the other, I'm really meaning the same thing. So there are biases and stereotypes with plastics in particular because when we usually encounter plastics in our life, it says toys, packaging, electronics, casing, any kind of consumer product like that are what we call consumer grade plastics. However, plastics actually come in four distinct tiers. We call it the thermoplastic rectangle of quality and also price. So all those plastics that most people encounter in everyday life are at that bottom tier of the, the rectangle, uh, which is, um, you know, we call it commodity grade. The next step up is the engineering grade. That is where Redwood mostly plays, but there's also a high performance grade above that. And then there's a grade above that called imodized plastics, which are so expensive they could be hundreds or even thousands of dollars per square foot. You get phenomenal quality, but there's you know a price difference with that. And we'll, we'll get into that as one of the myths. So my takeaway goal here is to help you if you specify materials, to spec better. If you're a purchaser, to buy better. If you're an end user, to decrease premature failure in your application by better selecting a plastic or rubber. And ultimately for everybody, this should increase profits and I would perhaps add their reducing downtime. So as part of my job, I mentioned that I've seen all the website RFQs for eight years. I did an informal count based on averages that I've always taken for weekly RFQs, and I know I've seen at minimum 10,000, okay? So that's a pretty large sample size that I've processed, 10,000 website RFQs. And with such a sample size, some distinct myths and misconceptions have come up. So a lot of what I'm commenting on has to do with these, these requests for quotes. And so that's where a lot of this comes from. Now, just a disclaimer before we dive into myth number one, because I'm bringing up myths and misconceptions that are primarily customer driven, I wanna be very careful in that my tone and my language is not meant to be condescending, okay? I, I'm trying to be constructive, but I realize that I may perhaps bring up myths or misconceptions that you have. And in fact, that is the goal, but the goal here is correction, not condescension. So please, as I work through this, uh, I, I don't want my tone to be taken as condescending. I, I want to help. So myth number one has to do with a little bit with what I talked about, the thermoplastic rectangle, which is it's just plastic. And that's actually a quote that I've got several times uh, given to me by customers, almost always customers that are new to industrial plastic and rubber. They find something they're interested in on the website, they get a quotation, they get some sticker shock and go, whoa. And uh, they go, but it's just plastic. And so we, we hear that a lot. So the stereotype of that is that plastics are meant to be cheap. As I said, you know, the toys we buy for our children, the packaging we buy that our shampoo is in, 
Those are inexpensive because they're made of inexpensive consumer grade plastic. So the myth that customers have is that say uh, an industrial grade plastic that's what we sell on our website will then be cheaper than the metal or wood traditional material that we are in fact replacing with the plastic. A good example of this is plastic lumber, okay? So we get a lot of customers and, and truthfully, they're usually members of the public, meaning hobbyists, they're not connected with the company, but they want a quotation on plastic lumber, which we can get, but their belief is that that plastic, because quote, it's just plastic, will be more inexpensive than just lumber from a hardware store. And that's, that's completely inaccurate. And so that's something we have to discuss. Uh, in fact, the plastic lumber that we sell is engineering grade, it's fiberglass reinforced, it's excellent stuff. You can build some really cool things with it that does come at a cost. And so the takeaway point here is that performance plastics, they offer quality and life cycle cost reduction. Okay, so when plastics replace metal or wood, and sometimes glass, they tend to last longer, they require less maintenance, less replacement, so it's a higher quality material. But yes, that comes at a financial cost, and it's pretty linear. The higher you go up in that thermoplastics rectangle I mentioned, linear the cost of the, the solution will go up as well. But to throw a cliche back at the it's just plastic cliche, you get what you pay for the plastic. You get an excellent product that's going to give you really, really good uh, service. As long as we go through the whole process of making a proper recommendation, we get the information on the operational environment, 99 times out of 100, we can match you with something great. So that's myth number one. Myth number two. Plastics pollute and are bad for the environment. If you're a member of the plastics industry, this is one of the first myths that come crashing down. The truth is, is that most plastics are in fact highly recyclable and not only that, but valuable. Each week I have plastic recyclers spamming me with emails, occasionally phone calls, begging for scrap plastic because it's very lucrative to take that scrap and recycle it into what we call repro or reprocessed materials. In fact, one of our most popular plastics of all that we sell and fabricate parts from is reprocessed UHMW polyethylene. So plastics are very recyclable and, and valuable as well. So what's the disconnect here? Well, it's a mix of political will in recycling initiatives. And I'm talking here also about the consumer grade plastics, you know, plastic straws, uh, stuff like that. Those are just lower grades of the industrial plastics we sell. Most of them are fully recyclable as well, but there's a lack of political will in getting proper recycling uh, programs going. There's frankly a media bias against plastic. The media just seems to really have it out against plastic, but also there's personal responsibility. If I choose, I can throw a plastic bottle in the garbage because it's easy, or I can find a place to recycle it or collect it and bring it to the recycling depot. And, you know, when we hear about plastics in the ocean and clogging up rivers, that's because of poor disposal of these plastic products. And we, we as a society, as people, as humans, need to own that that's on us. Now, an additional point to that is advantages of plastic. So there's less it takes less energy actually to manufacture the plastics, believe it or not. Uh, it takes less energy to transport them because they're lighter than say metal, glass. Uh, it's less energy to move a mated component which saves power. So for example, all our locations stock what's called UHMW polyethylene chain channel. Uh, it's used a lot in sawmills but also agriculture. And when you put that, that plastic in a channel and you run a chain along it, that chain, because the plastic is so slick, that chain actually requ requires less power to move it along that channel now. So you're saving electricity by doing that. And in regards to wood, well, plastic obviously is not removing anything from the biosphere. Plants are carbon capture, carbon sink. Uh, to produce plastic, you don't have to remove any, any plants from the environment. 
which obviously you do to uh, manufacture wood products. So that's myth number two. Please don't believe the media bias out there that plastics are, are bad for the environment. They, they don't at all have to be. Myth number three, this is something we get a lot is someone will say, yeah, but isn't metal stronger? You know, how would a plastic bushing work better than brass or bronze? Isn't metal stronger? Well, I think the myth here is you have to define what is strength, okay? So if strength is only defined to you by compressive strength, so you put a piece of plastic over a span and you compress it down the middle and wait for it to bend or break, yeah, sure. In that case, metal is probably going to be stronger. But if by any other definition, if you define strength as lasting longer in a wear application, as being more chemical or corrosion resistant, as lasting longer in an equivalent application, as being light, uh, stronger, like per pound in the amount of, uh, you know, pressure velocity that a bushing can take. In so many other dimensions, plastics can be stronger or are stronger. And so the myth here is that metal is stronger when we don't know how we're defining strength. And my point here, my takeaway point, is that on many dimensions, plastic is stronger, just perhaps not on, on compressive load. So myth number four. This one is this one is tough. This one is something that we get very often in RFQs. Is someone says, "Hey, I need poly. I need a poly this, a poly liner, a poly something for my my house or or something like that." And the myth here is that poly means something. And the truth is that many many plastics. I actually had a list of ten, and I cut it down to three, uh, and that was just what I could think of off the top of my head. Many plastics start with the word poly. And so when you're an industry expert such as, as we are, and someone asks for poly, our first thought is, okay, poly what? Because we have to drill down. So it could be poly could mean polyurethane. Poly could mean a polyethylene type product. Poly could mean polypropylene. And that's just a family of product. Then I need to drill down with the customer and find the actual grade that they need and what the requirements are. So the myth is there's no such thing as, as poly. And if, a, if you think that poly, it ever skews that, you know, poly usually means something, you know, say 60, 70% of cases, that's not actually accurate. As we drill down with the customers, poly could be anything and everything. And there really is no one product that people think is poly more than the other. So how do we overcome this myth? Well, just approach an application with an open mind. I'd much rather, in key, if you're going to send me an RFQ, I'd much rather you just start telling me about your application and what you're looking to do than saying, you know, I need poly something. Um, we're the plastics experts. It's our job to help you find the best product that's going to give you the most success. So what I need from you is for you to know your application. I need you to know chemical exposure, if it's UV exposure, uh, the temperature range for the application, what you're trying to do with it. I could go through a million questions with you. You just need to know your own application. And if you can get that information to myself or us or our company, it's our job to take the burden of plastic selection off your plate. And we'd be happy to do that. So just as I go, we're on myth number four, we're about to go on myth number five. So we have six myths, we have six misconceptions and one page of FAQs. So just if you wonder how far along we are in the presentation. So myth number five is rubber specific. And it's that we get asked to quote some neoprene or neoprene, neoprene product. So neoprene is a type of rubber. We sell many, many types of rubber. Um, but neoprene is the one type of rubber that seems to be well known, even by people that are not very familiar with rubber products. And nobody wants to, we all have a, a measure of pride. Nobody wants to sound like they don't know what they're looking for. So we'll often get people asking us for neoprene products, where when we ask about the application, it doesn't actually make sense that neoprene would be used there. And what we often discover is exactly what I'm talking about, that the customer just did not want to sound uneducated, but actually didn't know what to ask for. And when we discuss with customers, well, what type of rubber are you using now? 
uh, we often get, we have a saying that, you know, to, to, we tend to be told something like, well, it's flat, it's black, and it's stored out back, meaning in the back of the yard. When we do, when I do rubber training as a segment for a new sales staff, I use that exact term, flat, black, and, and stored out back. Um, the issue with asking for neoprene for everything as well, there's a few. Um, neoprene is kind of like a Swiss army knife. Uh, it's good at many things, but it doesn't excel at everything. And it does have some drawbacks, some severe drawbacks that may even lead to application failure, depending what you're trying to use it in. So similar to myth number four, if you have a rubber application, I'd much rather just know what you're doing with the application and I'll help you find the right grade of rubber for it. Because often it's actually not going to be neoprene, believe it or not. Uh, the other thing is overpaying. Neoprene is actually above average in price compared to many rubbers. So let's take, for example, if you have a conveyor and you just need a simple rubber skirting for it that goes along the side. That's all you care about, just skirting to keep the odd bit of you know, sand or rocks in. Well, all you really need is an inexpensive, say, SBR70 rubber skirt there that I could do for a third of the price of neoprene. But if you're asking for neoprene and I sell you neoprene, you're going to pay three times the cost of what you actually need. So my takeaway point here, if you're trying to specify or buy a rubber, bring us your application. Don't just ask for a rubber blindly, um, especially if it's neoprene. Let us help. Let us make a recommendation. Myth number six, I left this one for the end because this is probably the biggest of them all and the one that we spend the most time on, which is that uh, the myth is that a brand name equals a product name. Now, I can't blame our customers for this because what has happened is the brand names for certain plastic products have become so integral in the industry that people actually think that's the name of the plastic. Uh, so the five biggest ones are Teflon, which is actually PTFB, Lexan, Delrin, Plexiglass, and Nylatron. None of those five actually mean a specific product. They are a brand for various plastics. Now, the problem is, is that like any other brand, you can see I use pictures of Kraft Dinner, Macaroni, and Cheese, you're going to pay more for the brand name. And you might have reduced avail availability, but you're for sure going to pay more to get that brand name. So you need to ask yourself, are you fine with a generic equivalent where you don't care who manufactured it, but it's equivalent properties? Or do you actually need that brand? And why I say that is if you're a machinist, you may be given a print that specifies Nylatron and your end user may be firm that it must be Nylatron. And in that case, it's perfectly fine for you to procure that brand name. But Delrin is probably the biggest one in plexiglass now with the prevalence of, of customers looking for health barriers. People ask for Delrin and plexiglass. Well, Delrin specifies a specific brand of homopolymer acetyl. That's what it actually is. And that's much more expensive than the, you know, pretty much equivalent copolymer acetyl that we stock that has no name. So you get better price and availability if you were to ask for acetyl versus Delrin. So what I do and what I try to train our staff is if you come to me with an RFQ for one of these brand names, the first thing we're supposed to ask is, do you actually need that brand or can I offer you an equivalent? Plexiglass is actually probably the most deadly of those five. So plexiglass specifies acrylic, but it specifies what's called cast acrylic, which is actually a more expensive grade of acrylic than most companies stock. Uh, most customers and users wouldn't notice a difference with cast acrylic. It's a little, it has a little bit higher clarity um, and it's uh, a little bit stronger with impact, but plexiglass actually specifies that more expensive cast acrylic. So if I blindly quote you plexiglass, uh, you may definitely be wasting money there unless you absolutely need a, a cast product. So just keep that in mind. Don't overpay unless you have a hard spec for that brand. You see, I use Noni macaroni and cheese. You just want macaroni and cheese, save yourself a couple bucks a box. Would be ten, tends to be much higher than a couple bucks uh, for plastics if you're willing to go with a generic equivalent. 
Okay, so we're moving on to the misconceptions, which are more um, not so much general in the public sphere, but more specific to applications. So now you're on the quotation stage or you're ready to buy. So that's the difference between this and misconception. So misconception number one is get me that performance at half the price. Uh, believe it or not, we get asked to do that a lot. So we go through with our customer. Uh, we ask about the application environment. We get all the information we need. And we provide you with a quote based on the best match of price and performance that meets your requirement. And I go back to that whole sticker shock thing with the very first myth. The customer goes, okay, I like what you're telling me. Now get me that exact same performance at half the cost or 30% less, or I don't have the budget for this. And the problem with that is what I also mentioned at the beginning of this uh, seminar is that cliche, you get what you pay for with plastics is very often true. I cannot, in all cases, I cannot get you the exact same performance at less cost. So if a customer asks me this, I have to start telling them what you're going to give up by paying less. So you have to give up perhaps UV resistance. Uh, the plastic will take less load. Uh, it won't be, it won't have integral oil or grease or something like that. So I have to start listing what you're going to lose. And the example here, I like cars. So in a, a car example here is, you know, I can't go to a Ford dealership and test drive a GT500 with you know, 500 horsepower and say, great, that's awesome, but I don't like the price. Can you give me all that performance in a Ford Focus? And <laughs> Ford Focus is actually what I drive. It's a beautiful car, don't get me wrong, but there's no way that uh, my Ford Focus could ever have the performance of the GT500. Um, a lot of this burden should be on us as Redwood Plastics. I try to teach our people, uh, we use a, a method of asking questions called B stamped. And I won't go through all of that, but the B stands for budget. It's our job to ask you the budget up front. I had a situation a few years ago. I had a solar, a new solar uh, power station in California, one of those ones in the desert where all these mirrors, you know, track the sun and focus the sun on a central point, which boils oil, turns the turbine, makes power. Okay. So for the mirrors, they wanted a plastic bushing that would last uh, 25 years, never need to be greased, was UV stable, impact resistant, wouldn't wear out. Great. I found a, a a plastic that would do it. It was, uh, it was called Torlon. And uh, got them a quote. It's $22 a bushing. They said, great. Sounds awesome. But my budget's $2 a bushing. And that was my fault. I never asked them what their budget was. Had I known their budget was $2 a bushing for a bushing that would last that long and meet those specs, I could have politely declined and said I, I knew there was no way I could find them a solution. So misconception uh, is that you can get exact performance at a lower cost out of a plastic. Misconception number two, uh, there's, well, there's a two and a 2.5 here. So the real two is that color equals gray. So a lot of times we'll, you know, a customer may come to us asking us to uh, uh, quote apart for them and we'll ask them, okay, well, what's the plastic it's being made out of now? Well, I don't know, it's blue or it's black or it's gray or you pick any color. Um, unfortunately, that's, not something that we can really work with. Uh, manufacturers, of course, there's many manufacturers of plastics. They will color their uh, materials differently than others for even the same grade. There's not a standard. So unfortunately, that's, that's not a way that we can identify a product. Uh, that's really simple. That's a really simple misconception. So I added a 2.5, which is that color is easy to get. So a lot of times customers will ask us, you know, hey, I like that uh, UHMW product you have, um, but I like it in red, and they may only need a couple square feet. Well, that's not possible. And why is it not possible? Well, you can get colors from any plastics, but the manufacturers often have high minimums, anywhere from 10 sheets, say 4 foot by 10 foot, upwards of 5,000, 10,000 pounds of material minimum run to get colors. So colors on industrial or performance plastics are not easy to procure. And I, why is there this misconception? Well, I think it's that, again, I fall back on those consumer grade products that are used in the public. They're so colorful. You can get packaging and toys and stuff like that in all different colors and companies seem to have easy access for it. So people tend to assume that when you get into industrial plastics, which are obviously functional, they're meant to be made into parts that get greasy, dirty, abraded, 
that, uh, you know, nice colors are easy to get, but that's, that's simply inaccurate. Um, often it's one color, if you're lucky, two for a material that's easy to get. And uh, you have to ask yourself, why do you need a color? Okay, is it critical to your application that you need a certain color, or is it just because you think it makes your equipment look nicer? Because we can get it for you, but it's going to be costly. Misconception number three, everything is available in any size. I've got a, <laughs> I've got a story for this one here, um, which is I had an RFQ a few years ago from an engineer, and he had sent me all these drawings. He had made this very um, intricate piping system. I tried to find a picture that kind of looked like his design, and so that's what you see there. He's done this really intricate piping system uh, made from Tiber 88 uh, uh, UHMW. Tiber 88 is an excellent uh, UV stable um, lining material. It lines a lot of hoppers, train cars, things like that. So this guy designed a piping system with it. And I called him and I said, well, where did you get your specs for this pipe? So, well, it's plastic. Plastic's made in the pipe. You have to have Tiber 88 pipe. I said, well, no, it doesn't exist. It's never existed. It's only available in sheet form. Our website doesn't say any different. Our website doesn't offer it in pipe. And I felt bad for the guy. I really did because I could hear how deflated he was because I didn't say it was in an email. I said it was in a phone, you know, a phone call. And he's like, oh, okay. So it's, it's really, really not available in pipe. And the guy probably wasted so much time on this because he just didn't ask. So my point to you is, don't assume that a plastic or rubber is available in any particular um, shape or profile. And I'm specifically speaking to those of you that are doing design, okay? Someone else this is probably not relevant for. So what's the thing to do? Just ask us. If you're interested in a certain plastic uh, for an application or rubber, shoot us an email, give us a phone call, just even ask if it's available before you start on your design, please. So misconception number four, I have to grease this plastic bearing. These are discussions we have a lot with customers, and it's not that time-consuming, but it's something that comes up so often, which is uh, customers are used to greasing metal bearings, and they, they're very concerned about greasing a plastic bearing. Well, the good news about plastics is they often don't need to be greased. Um, first of all, a lot of them are self-lubricating. So what that means is that... Uh, Plastic, when mated with a component, say it's a bearing and it's mated with a, a shaft, well, as that starts to rotate, the plastic is going to wear a microscopic film of itself onto the shaft. So it's self-lubricating that shaft with itself, which makes it, you know, makes rotation much smoother, much easier. There's your lubrication. And that can be done without grease. That's just a property of plastic. Um, now, you can grease. Greasing doesn't necessarily eat away at the plastic. It doesn't make it weaker or anything like that. And so I tell customers who are very, very concerned about uh, greasing that, okay, if you really want to grease, throw in some white lithium grease in there that makes you feel better, but you don't need it. Um, but the problem with that is that greasing can increase contamination potential. So grease can carry in grit, uh, sand, any sort of contamination and plastics because they're they're obviously softer than metal on that contamination can do more damage. So greasing can sometimes hurt from a contamination perspective. And my last point is many, many plastics with all different price points are available in oil or solid lubricant filled. So if you don't want to grease at all, if you don't want to do maintenance at all on the plastic, we can really help you out and it's not difficult. So. My point here is trust the plastic and trust the lubricated grades of plastic to do the lubrication. You don't need to stuff, stuff it full of grease. Misconception five is what glue do I use for this? So we often will quote a product and we get asked, what glue do I use to attach this hopper liner or whatever? Well, the misconception is that gluing or adhesive bonding is a good solution for most uh, plastics. It's actually not. Um, adhesive bonding usually creates a weak point, which is where the bond occurs. Um, there are certain exceptions to that, such as we offer a strong bond product for elastomers, which are rubber and polyurethane. Uh, that's actually a very, very strong bonding agent. But for a lot of the thermoplastics, like UHMW polyethylene, that's the one that people really, really want to bond adhesively. 
and we say here nothing sticks to UH&W. There's no, there's no adhesive or glue that's going to work well at all for that. So the answer is to affix mechanically, if at all possible. We would tell you it's, it's really your only choice. And sometimes customers will say to me, well, you know, Matt, I don't want to drill a bolt through my hopper to attach your UHMW. And I go, well, you don't have to. There's a solution for that. We have something called a weld washer, which is you don't need a drill. You know, you just have a counterboard hole, stick in a weld washer, you weld in the center, you put on a cap, you're done. And there's no drilling. So there are mechanical solutions for many applications, but in general, um, adhesives and glues don't work. And especially off the shelf glues, like strong bond is something we use internally here. We do occasionally sell it. We will sell it to you by the bucket. Um, but that's a specialized adhesive agent and stuff you can buy off the shelf just, just doesn't work. Okay, misconception number six, this is the final misconception, is that we get a lot of quote requests where we're given something like a part on the right. That's actually a part that is trademarked by us. That's a shark fin lug. Um, that's myself, my hand on my desk, because I, I didn't want to use a customer's example for obvious reasons. But we'll get a picture like that, and we'll say, you know, be told, please quote. Well, we don't know what it's made out of. We only know one dimension of the geometry. Uh, we don't know really how big it is. So for us to quote here, we need to know everything. And maybe someone else can just, you know, whip off a price, you know, offhand and, and make money or something like that, more power to them. For us here, our estimators are told, and they do indeed need to know all the geometry. So unfortunately, a request like this just is inadequate to provide a, a, an accurate price. So there's a couple ways around this. Uh, first of all, is to just simply get a good drawing that has all the dimensions. We can work off that. We still need to identify the material. And just to note there, I often cannot identify material just from a picture. Um, if you send a piece of the material to us. Uh, we have a couple guys here that can do what's called an old school burn test. Their noses, somehow they've learned uh, to actually, if you burn a little bit of plastic, they can smell it. And depending on how it smells, each plastic is unique. They can tell me what it is. Um, the alternative, the alternative to this situation, if you can't make a drawing, just mail us a sample. I get samples mailed to me all the time. Maybe every two or three days a new sample comes in. And the thing about the sample is we can figure out what it's made out of. We can do all the measurements, get all the geometry from it. Um, we can examine the surface finish. We can do everything we need to make a correct part if we have a sample in hand. So takeaway point, fully dimensioned drawing. A CAD file is actually best if you can do it or just mail us a sample. But fortunately, we can't get you an a accurate quote just based off a picture like this. So lastly is the FAQs. And so I just went through, I was just thinking and I went through a bunch of my old RFQs and I just was looking for, you know, what, what were the most common. And so let's start with what plastics are UV stable? Well, okay, so first of all, we have a number of plastics that are UV stable, but that's the wrong question because we, if I'm trying to work with you to figure out what you need best for your application, Giving you a list of UV stable plastics is not going to help. I need to match you on other dimensions, many other dimensions, for what your application demands more than UV stability. Uh, it's a good question to ask. Environment, but my point is there's so much to do with it. Next one we get is what do you have on the shelf? Well, I mean, if you're desperate, if you're desperate in your application and you just need to keep going for a couple days or something, Maybe an off-the-shelf plastic will, you, will work for you, but by far, it's best to not so much care what's on the shelf, but care what's right, what's best for your application. And for that, for customers that ask, you know, what do you have on the shelf, I basically ask, you know, what are you doing with it and how quickly do you need it? And if there's any sort of response that's like, well, you know, I only actually need it three weeks from now, but, um, you know, I just don't want to put you through the trouble of bringing in something on special order for me. Well, okay, in that case, I say really it's no trouble at all. I'd like to actually hook you up what is the best plastic or rubber for your application. Another FEQ we get is how long will it last? This one is hard because it's impossible to answer. Um, I don't know 
I mean, I can make a good recommendation on what plastic or rubber matches up to your application based on what you're telling me, but I can't tell you how long it'll last. What if it's a bushing and you, one customer only pushes it, say, in a, a kiln cart, you know, two, three times a week? Another customer makes a similar bushing out of the same material, but the, it's on a cart that's running 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So I can't judge how long it's going to last. We get, le we get asked this a lot in regards to UV exposure. And the problem is customers are all over North America or the world. So if you're located, you know, at the bottom of the Florida panhandle, your UV resistance or the amount of time that it's going to take for your plastic to start degrading because of UV is going to be much, much higher than if I sell you the exact same product in Northern Saskatchewan, Canada. But I can't tell you in either application how long it's going to last. The only exception to this is certain plastics like our twin wall polycarbonate will have a 10-year guarantee against UV exposure. Well, in that case, I can tell you at least 10 years because it's guaranteed by the manufacturer. But in most cases, how long will it last? You just need to use it. So the other next question we get is next, you know, FAQ is how much is it better than? Well, that's that's really hard to say. We get this a lot when it's um, when we're replacing a metal with a plastic product. Well, how much better is your plastic? Well, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it should wear longer. It should need less greasing or replacement. Um, but how much better it is, we just have to experiment. And the most I can give is a range, but it's a really liberal range. I mean, typically plastics, in my experience for my customers, have outworn metal two to six times in lifespan. But I can't get it any closer than that. And that's only if we've done all our, our homework on matching up the right uh, plastic to the application. The other FAQ we get is where are you located? Now, I don't really get a, I don't really have a comment on this one, except the, the main way that you can access our, our phone number or email system is obviously off our contact us page, which, which uh, gives all our locations. And this is just the FAQ that seems to come up often at the end of the process. Now, we're trained um, in my department to look up and research where the customer is right away because I have an assistant who uh, covers um, about two-thirds of North America. Now, I, with my, my expanded role, I only cover about one-third. And so we divvy up the work based on that. But it, at the end of the, the conversation that the customer goes, oh, where, where actually are you? So I just found that interesting. Now, there's a break here in the bullet points because now we're moving to three FAQs that I most often ask. So these are the questions that I'm asking. Um, and actually, number one is, uh, what do you mean by UHMW Black? That really is the number one. So UHMW, I've mentioned it a number of times here. It's an extremely popular industrial plastic. And people will call it often UHMW Black. And I need to fall back on that misconception, I think it was misconception two, that color equals grade, there are actually four grades of commonly sold black UHMW. And customers may say UHMW black and mean virgin black or UV stable black or anti-static black or reprocessed black, uh, but it actually doesn't refer to any specific grade. So I'm often asking the customer, what do you mean by UHMW black? And uh, as I go through my process, um, it could be any one of those different grades of black that I just mentioned. Uh, the second one is, what is the maximum operating temperature? Uh, we'll often get an RFQ saying, hey, I need a plastic for a hot environment. Well, does hot just mean being outside in Arizona when it hits 40 degrees in July? Or does hot mean you're sticking it in a baking oven, you know, that has to handle, you know, say 250 degrees Celsius? Um, so basically, I have to define hot. And I also sometimes have to define cold because we'll get asked the same thing. You know, how is this plastic in cold? Well, certain plastics can take laboratory cryogenic temperatures that we sell. Certain plastics start to get brittle at around minus 12 degrees Celsius. So I need to figure out how cold cold really is. Um, the other one that might surprise you, uh, the last one here, is uh, chemical exposure by percentage. So if you actually look up chemi chemical exposure charts for plastics online, you'll notice a lot of them, especially the good ones, actually have two ratings per plastic per chemical, 
One is usually, say, a 20% exposure level, and the other is a 70% exposure level. That's typical. And that's because a plastic may be perfectly resistant to a given chemical at a 20% exposure level, but if you move to 70%, suddenly that plastic is going to degrade and degrade quickly. So when a customer tells me, uh, you know, Matt, I have a, a plastic that's going to be exposed to sulfuric acid, I go, okay, is it, you know, aerosol sulfuric acid, is it liquid sulfuric acid, meaning, you know, how consistent is the application of the acid going to be on the part, but also what is the percentage of exposure? And honestly, I can understand that it's sometimes hard to get that, but unfortunately without that, it basically points me in the direction where I have to assume a very high level of exposure, unless you tell me otherwise. So that's something that, uh, you know, if you happen to work in environments where you're specifying materials where chemical uh, exposure is a concern, the more information you can get us on that chemical exposure is beneficial. And so I would ask, can you think of other FAQs that you ask? So um, that's really it. That's all I've got today for the presentation. So I hope that that was uh, eye-opening a little bit. I hope that was um, some good general knowledge for you on what we see and what we're being asked and the myths and misconceptions that are out there. And I hope even if it's just one little thing that you can take away from this time that will help you spec better or buy better, uh, that you you found that beneficial. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Matt. Um, just a reminder to everybody that there is a Q&A panel um, on your screen that you can enter questions in and then we will get to those in a minute. Okay, so one question is, um, what is the difference between recycled plastic and reprocessed plastic? Yeah, well, think of reprocessed as, as uh, how do I put this? I want to say something like a, a professionally recycled product. So let's, let's go to our re, Repro UHMW, which is our, our most popular um, reprocessed product. So what they do with UHM, UHMW Repro is they take some old, some scrap of UHMW, they pulverize it either into a powder or they just shred it into really small bits. Then they mix it with virgin resin. So what you're actually buying is not a 100% recycled product, but you're buying a mix of some regrind or pulverized material mixed in with virgin but you still are getting an industrial grade performance plastic out of it. Recycling plastic can just mean anything. It can mean you just shred up a bunch of different plastics, melt it in a pot on your stove and make something that looks pretty out of it. Um, you see that, uh, you can find videos like that all over YouTube. You know, another example of a recycling of plastic, there's new what's called high temperature polymer asphalt that's been used out there in certain states and provinces. In that case, they just grind up plastic, mix it with asphalt and pave a road with it. So yeah, you're, you know, it's, it's polymer asphalt. It's technically a recycled plastic, but you're not making another industrial or performance material out of it like repro. Okay, so another question is, um, you mentioned that with certain brand names, the quality could be better. With plexiglass, what's the difference between the branded and the other non-branded in terms of quality? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple things. So the issue with plexiglass specifically is that acrylic, which, which okay, so what it's referring to is acrylic, but cast acrylic. So there's what's called cast acrylic, and extruded acrylic. Most of what distributors like us will stock is extruded acrylic. Why? Because it's less expensive than cast and because most people can't tell the difference. But for a company like us that has to be thinking of every little detail, when you ask us for plexiglass, which we know is a brand of cast acrylic, 
I have to ask you, okay, well, do you need this brand and do you need a cast product? So if you're asking for the difference in properties, cast acrylic is a little bit more clear. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more see-through, but honestly, if you had two panels side by side, I don't think your eyes are going to notice. It's like on a technical level, like an, an increase of transparency of say 3% or something like that. It's, it's slight, but it's there. Um, the other thing about cast acrylic is it's more impact resistant. So um, if you're Canadian like I am and you like hockey, uh, the glass uh, around a hockey rink is actually all cast, not extruded acrylic because it uh, takes more impact from players getting body checked into it. As you know, there's some you know really entertaining videos of that glass still smashing because it's not unbreakable, but it's stronger than extruded. The only other thing I would mention about extruded is in the past, there have been issues with its manufacturing because it's extruded, which means it's being pushed through a die instead of just cast in place, that there's occasionally small marks on it. Think of it like scrape marks, but not really that bad, just very slight discoloration due to the extrusion. But that really is not so much an issue anymore. Um, I would go so far as to tell you, unless you have a spec, for cast acrylic, or you're using it in a safety glass type application, or you're using it in a hockey rink, you're just fine with extruded acrylic and you're not gonna notice the difference. Okay, that was it for the questions. Um, if anybody does have any questions or you think of something after the fact, um, Matt's email is on the screen there. And of course you can go to our website as well and email um, from there, contact any one of our branch locations and got a, a laundry list of people that are just as knowledgeable um, as Matt to be able to answer application and material questions as well. So thank you everybody for joining. A copy of this presentation will be going out tomorrow to everybody as well and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank Thanks you all. So much. Take care.